In my last video, Time for Grown-Ups, I promised that the next one would be about our cousins, the men with the J2BY chromosome. But even as I was making that one, no fewer than four high-end DNA studies came out that really bring the Stone Age and the Bronze Age to life. We're going back more than 20,000 years now and in very fine-grained detail. So before I do one more video, I want to make sure my case is based on as solid a foundation as possible. Here's the upshot. I win. Now, I've said several times in my previous videos that although I make a lot of crazy claims about my race and its history, I'm actually very conservative on this issue. It's easy to buy into your own bullshit. But this new DNA race is far beyond anything I claimed in my previous videos. We really are a bolt out of the blue, and our DNA markers really are a symptom that we're something special. But there are a lot of people in the historical DNA research community who go out of their way to muddy the water when it comes to my race. I don't know who they are, and I certainly don't know how they organize this. Right now I'm in a charitable mood, and I assume they're coming across things that they don't expect to see, and so they try to fit them into patterns that do not exist. It happens, even to me. But you know how sometimes a river fills up with a lot of water really fast, and then it suddenly changes course and buries a town and kills a lot of people in the town? It's time to murder your darlings. These four papers actually answer two different questions. The first is back here in the Neolithic, the Late Stone Age, when we know there were two migrations of early farmers into Europe. The first group moved into the Balkan Peninsula, we now know from Turkey, and they created the Western and Eastern Linear Pottery Culture. The second group moved through the Mediterranean where they created the Cardium Pottery Culture. The question is, are these two groups related? And the answer is, they are the same people. The first paper is, early farmers from across Europe directly descended from Neolithic Aegeans. Here are where they got their samples, I'm not going to pronounce these sites because I can't, we're all on our own here. Unfortunately, other than for reading between the lines, these papers aren't going to help me out because by my reckoning we need samples from Central Turkey, especially from a site called Chatalayuk. But while they've recovered beautiful bones from Chattel Hayuk, they haven't extracted any DNA from those bones yet. That's nobody's fault. The area until now was too warm. But with the new techniques they've used to extract DNA from the Northwest and from Greece, as you'll see later from Spain, that is undoubtedly about to change. And I can't wait, even if I do turn out to be wrong. But Chattel Hayuk is a very important site, and events there probably drove that initial expansion into Europe. Recent radiocarbon dating indicates that by 6600 to 6500 BC, sedentary farming communities were established in northwest Anatolia and in coastal west Anatolia, but did not expand north of the Aegean for another several hundred years. All these sites show material cultural affinities with the central and southwest Anatolian Neolithic. So these men were in direct contact with Chattel Hayuk. And if you've been watching my videos, you know that 6500 BC is a grim chapter in the history of that site. It was overcrowded, and the people there were overworked. That actually shows up in those beautiful bones of theirs that we've recovered. I go over all of that in part six of my series, The Children of Proteus. The children go forth. So these men might actually be from Chattel Hayek, which means my people were not. Because as I said, we weren't part of that first wave of farmers into Europe. We were the second wave. But I'm not really worried. They had farming, but they don't act anything like South Central Anatolians. That second wave acted just like them. Now, events farther south confirm that a second group of farmers were on the move. At the exact same time these people were moving into the Balkans, Southern Anatolians were migrating to Crete. And we don't need to recover Neolithic DNA from Crete to know that that's true. Now, when I say that people in the historic DNA research community are going out of their way to muddy the water in the history of my race, I'm not angling for an Oscar for Best Actor. Here's my first piece of evidence. This is a graph of the different DNA populations covered here. French, Spanish, North Italian, Tuscan, that's North Central Italy. We look at the Greeks, the West Sicilians, the East Sicilians, the Southern Italians, the Sardinians, who are we missing? Oh yeah, the Romans, Central Italy, 
Here we see the expansion of the Roman Republic on the left and the Papal States on the right. Seriously, you're not interested in us. The ridiculous just gets worse. You don't have to trust me. I'll show you. But onward into this otherwise splendid case. Here you see that all of these farmers are the same people, from Turkey up into modern Germany and all the way over into Spain. Consistent with their PCA clustering, the northern Aegean genomes share high levels of genetic drift amongst each other and with all other previously characterized European Neolithic genomes, including early Neolithic from northern Spain, Hungary, and Central Europe. Given the archaeological context of the different samples, the most parsimonious explanation for this shared drift is migration of early European farmers from the northern Aegean into and across Europe. But over in Greece and Turkey, outside of Crete to the south, you can't really tell who went where. That's because these people obviously stayed in contact with each other and intermarried. However, while these results conform to a Neolithic dispersal from Anatolia to Greece and then to the rest of Europe, it is not possible to infer a direction for dispersal within the Aegean with statistical confidence, since both the Greek and Anatolian genomes copy from each other to a similar extent. We therefore see the origins of European farmers equally well represented by early Neolithic Greek and Northwestern Anatolian genomes. And these men had, as I expected, a G2A Y chromosome. We're J2A, a different group of men altogether, which is why I say that if they came from Chattelhayuk, we almost certainly did not. So in my next video with the J2B men, I've still got a mystery on my hand. When did these J2B men arrive in Albania, where they live to this day, and where did they come from? Because I was hoping these two studies would help me out. I'm pretty sure I'm looking at a migration by sea here, I just haven't found the boat yet. Now in modern Europe, all the different men with their different Y chromosomes are pretty thoroughly mixed in together, and it seems like it was always that way, but that's not so. We all came in from our own separate corner. The J2Bs grouped together. The G2As grouped together. We J2As came in from our own part of the world. Later you're going to see the R1As and the R1Bs. The R1As are Slavic, like the Russians and the Polish. The R1Bs live mostly in Western Europe. Regardless of whether the Aegean early farmers were ultimately descended from Western or Central Anatolian, or even Levantine hunter-gatherer, the differences between the ancient genomes presented here and those from the Caucasus indicates that there was considerable structuring of forager populations in Southwest Asia prior to the transition to farming. Again, we're all in our own little corner. The Caucasus men are J2A, and they're probably related to us, but they are not us. And here's more. The dissimilarity and lack of continuity of the early Neolithic Aegean genomes to modern Turkish and Levantine populations in contrast to those of early Central and Southwestern European farmer and modern Mediterraneans, is best explained by subsequent gene flow into Anatolia from yet unknown sources. So these early farmers are alive and well in our part of Europe, unlike their original homeland of Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, and Israel. So I would like to reiterate a point that I made in The Children of Proteus. There's a modern slander and libel going around that we Romans were brutal bullies, and I would like to point out that everywhere else in the world these early farmers used to live, northern Europe as well as the Middle East, they are gone, but they're alive and well with us. You're about to see the same thing on the steppes of Russia. We find a primitive population, and we get along with them just fine. And a bully is a coward. We slew plenty of giants in our day, and we did our own dirty work. Unlike our icky, creepy little friends in Hollywood, who like to talk trash about us when they're outside of arm's reach, in Tel Aviv... The next paper is A Common Genetic Origin for Early Farmers from Mediterranean Cardial and Central European LBK Cultures. LBK is Linear Band Karamic. That's the name the Germans gave to the Linear Band Culture. It's where we got the name from. I like Linear Band Karamic better. It's sexier, but it also reminds you of who deserves credit for the discovery. These researchers got Neolithic samples from Barcelona, Valencia, and Alicante. Now later in the Bronze Age, I think my people show up down here, but there are no samples here and I don't expect there to be any in this paper because they're talking about a much earlier age. I'm just giving you a heads up. Let's go straight to their conclusion. 
Archaeological evidence suggests that these farmers spread subsequently throughout Europe along at least two distinctive routes. Expansion along the first route commenced around 5900 years BC and is represented by the distinct Impressa culture that spread along the central and western Mediterranean basin. A later aspect of this culture, named Cardial, after the use of the serrated edge of the cockle shells and pottery decoration, reached the Iberian Peninsula no later than 5500 BC. So the very early date of 5500 BC means they're not sampling the Vincha. Seriously, you're not curious about the Vincha. Well, I'm curious about your lack of curiosity. If you saw my video, The Gods Descend, you know the Vincha at least invented metallurgy, and you can make a very strong case they built the world's first civilization. I know samples have been drawn from the Vincha, I know they are a completely separate group of farmers, and I can be pretty damn sure they've had an impact on modern Europe's population. Now maybe here you have a plausible excuse. You're trying to answer the question of how the Cardial and the LBK people are related. Mission accomplished. In the next two surveys, there's no such excuse. Now for one final conclusion. Our analysis indicate that both the LBK and Cardio peoples originated from a common ancient metapopulation that diverged along two different migration routes, one following the Danube River, LBK, and the other one following the northern Mediterranean coastline, Impressa and Cardio. Furthermore, we detect a discernible hunter-gatherer component in the cardial genome, which seems to derive from a population more closely related to the Eastern European hunter-gatherers than to the neighboring Iberian Labrania 1 sample. From the current genetic evidence, it seems clear that all early European farmers represent a fairly homogeneous group at both their genetic and phenotypic levels. Subsequent population movements from the Calcolithic onwards considerably altered considerably altered this scenario. So the population of Spain has changed a lot in the past 7,000 years, which is what you would expect. And these farmers also had intermixed with native hunter-gatherers, just not any of the hunter-gatherers living in Spain. They did that in the Balkans before they showed up. That's unexpected, but it does help prove that they came from the Balkans. Now we're going to turn to that second question. A little more than 4,000 years ago, a group of invaders came in from the steppes of Russia. They're related to Eastern hunter-gatherers, and somebody else, probably from the Middle East. Who were these people? Well, now we know. They had intermarried with people who were related to us. Just not us. Proving once again that people and their languages moved out of Anatolia and into the steppes of Russia. It wasn't the other way around. I'm referring, of course, to the Indo-European language. Upper Paleolithic genomes reveal deep roots of modern Eurasians. Mesolithic individuals, that's the Middle Stone Age, sampled from Spain all the way to Hungary, belong to a relatively homogeneous group termed Western Hunter-Gatherers, WHG. The expansion of early farmers, EF, out of the Levant during the Neolithic transition, that's the New Stone Age, led to major changes in the European gene pool, with almost complete replacement in the south, and increased mixing with local Western Hunter-Gatherers further north. Finally, a later wave originating from the early Bronze Age Jumnaya from the Pontic Steppe, carrying partial ancestry from ancient North Eurasians and ancestry from a second undetermined source, arrived from the east, profoundly changing populations and leaving a cline of admixture in Eastern and Central Europe. This view, which was initially based on a handful of genomes, was recently confirmed by extensive surveys of Eurasian samples from the Holocene. Okay. We are not the Western hunter-gatherers. We are not the early farmers. We are not the Yamnaya who came from the east. Those are the steppe invaders. We are not this undetermined source, although we are related to them. And we are not the ancient North Eurasians. All of this I will prove. No problem. But as you see, that doesn't stop them from pretending they've answered the question of who we are, the Romans. You know we're Europeans, right? Here's their genetic map. Our new hunter-gatherers are right in between the people living in the North Caucasus Mountains and the South Caucasus Mountains today. Those are the purple and copper rings. The West Asians of Turkey are the greenish gold rings. Here's their map, looking at how much these old hunter-gatherers from the Middle East have been mixed with modern populations. The people who are a very close match to them are dark red, and that's where they've lived for thousands of years. Okay, they're J2A like me, and the men with the biggest variety of my Y chromosome are over here in northern Iran and over here in Turkey, which means we probably showed up here first. So we're neighbors, which is what you'd expect. 
And you see from these people spread all over the old Roman Empire that we have the exact same basic mix with these old Middle Eastern hunter-gatherers, which means we're looking at a distinct group of relatives here in the south. That includes Israel, where we settled as the Philistines. You've got a lot of them right along the border of India and Pakistan. They look like us. Then you have these people up in Russia who also look like us, and I think they are us. We'll get to them later. And here are the invaders. They're actually more closely related to these hunter-gatherers than we are, and as you can see, they are a distinct group. You can easily tell where they end and we begin. Please note, that does not include Rome, and the Spanish look a lot like us too. So no matter how you come at this, we are a completely separate group of people. And as we look at more data, that's going to become more blatant. Now here's something interesting. We were the first white people on Earth. Like early farmer, but in contrast to Western hunter-gatherer, Caucasian hunter-gatherer carry a variant of the SLC24A5 gene associated with light skin color. This trait, which is believed to have risen to high frequency during the Neolithic expansion, may thus have a relatively long history in Eurasia, with its origin probably predating the late glacial maximum. So we were white people, and the original Europeans were not. There were two mutations that progressively lightened people's skins in Europe. We got the first one, but we did not get the second. Aristotle thought we had the perfect complexion, lighter than the Egyptians, but darker than the Northerners. It's okay if you think you're kind or better looking than everybody. The people who are telling you that's pathological and evil do not include themselves under that rubric. That tells you all you need to know. Now after this population got split off from us in the last ice age, their DNA shows they very nearly starved to death. We looked at runs on homozygosity, ROH, which inform on past population size. Both Western hunter-gatherer and Caucasian hunter-gatherer have a high frequency of ROH, and in particular the older CHG, said Serbia, show signs of recent consanguity, that's cousin marriage to be charitable, with a high frequency of longer ROH. In contrast, early farmer are characterized by lower frequency of ROH of all sizes, suggesting a less constricted population history, perhaps associated with a more benign passage through the late glacial maximum than the more northern populations. Now I'm going to finish with the most comprehensive of the four papers, and therefore the most ridiculous and borderline inexcusable, but also the most gratifying, if you pay close attention to their data and ignore their spin. Genome-wide patterns of selection in 230 ancient Eurasians. These other three papers could plausibly claim to just represent a narrow band of questions, but this one claims a global purview, and its authors go out of their way to throw us off the scent with incomplete genome presentations and thinly plausible scenarios. Let's start with one of the major bloodlines that they completely blow off. Here's a look at all of their samples. Again, no Vincia, no Sopot. They have samples from Western Hungary, as you can see, but they're too early. They represent those first European farmers we took a close look at who we are not. Now, this hammering on the Vincia and the Sopot might seem like I'm making a mountain out of a molehill, but it's really the authors who are ignoring an entire mountain range. These people apparently pop up out of nowhere, and look at what they're doing. Dramatic changes in the scale of cultivation occurred at the same time as did the shift to extramural cemeteries, the emergence of new expressive material culture, and the appearance of Tell villages in the northern Balkans, namely from the late 6th millennium BC. So now we're talking about the Vincia. A Tell is a mound, and a Tell village is exactly what you saw in south central Anatolia, like this one here. You have a hill because they'd build the new village on top of the old village, and sometimes the exact same buildings on top of their predecessors, facing the exact same direction. The first farmers did not build Tell villages, which is why I say they acted nothing like south central Anatolians. From this time, significant efforts were made to alter the land before planting and to employ cattle for traction and plowing. Cows and goats were now exploited for dairy and textile materials as well as for their meat. Indeed, part of the increasing status of cattle over time may have been due to the animal's new value derived from its secondary uses. Investment of labor, care, and foddering made cattle a true livestock. 
Growing wheats and barley in large fields was not unusual, and tell villages contained large grain silos full of carbonized grain. Grinding stoves are frequent finds in houses, and very large storage vessels are common. Food production had intensified, and with the scale of intensification came important social and political consequences. First among these were the requirements of labor, time, and knowledge needed, especially the ability to manage the labor required and to retain, distribute, and to store the plant goods produced. Management of labor for large-scale cultivation was complex. Some stages in the agricultural cycle, such as planting or harvesting, were disproportionately labor and time-consuming. Large numbers of people were needed to work intensively over a short period of time. Other stages, including the majority of a crop's growing time, required very few people doing very little. The bringing together and, critically, the sending away of people were potential management problems. Abilities to coordinate and coerce human resources were socio-political skills. Special technical skills and knowledge were also required. Critical to success were knowledge of when to plant and when to harvest. Miscalculations of either could have been disastrous. Equally important were skills and experience in processing harvested grain. Threshing, winnowing, and especially parching, parching were crucial and not necessarily equally available across the community. They might as well be space aliens, and the authors of this paper are not the least bit interested in looking at them. Don't you find that kind of strange? Especially since we know DNA data has been pulled. Now, I'm going to walk you through a part of this paper. The authors are presenting a migration problem. A group of people have migrated to the steppes of Russia, and they've mixed with the local population. They look like they're from the West, from the Balkans, but that can't be true because blah blah blah. But it is true. They come from the Balkans, and their own data shows that. After the Poltavka period, population change occurred in Samara, that's a section of Russia on the steppes of Russia. The late Bronze Age Srebnaya, who lived there, have around 17% Anatolian Neolithic or early European farmer ancestry. Previous work documented that such ancestry appeared east of the Urals, beginning at least by the time of the Sintashta culture. This is another culture nearby, and suggested that it reflected an eastward migration from the courted bird peoples of Central Europe. However, the fact that the Srebnaya also had such ancestry indicates that the Anatolian Neolithic or early European farmer ancestry could have come into the steppe from a more eastern source. Further evidence that migrations originating as far west as Central Europe may not have had an important impact on the late Bronze Age steppe comes from the fact that the Srebnaya possess exclusively R1AY chromosomes, and four of them, and one Voltavka male, Voltavka is the earlier period, belong to haplogroup R1A Z93, which is common in Central South Asians, very rare in present-day Europeans, and absent in all ancient Central Europeans studied to date. So let's talk about those Y chromosomes for a second. For some reason, there are people running around with our autosomal DNA. That's the DNA in your nucleus outside of the sex chromosomes. But they don't have our Y chromosome. Are they killing our men? Or maybe they're getting princess brides as a tribute or an exchange for an alliance. This is something that the Chinese did. Or maybe our men are just leaving. It's strange, but when I'm making the case that the Indo-European language is ultimately from Anatolia, this is the major reason why I always have to take an indirect route. So, but let's recap what we just read. The Srebnaya live west of the Sintashta, and they have less of that European and Anatolian DNA than the Sintashta do. Combine that with the fact that there are more men to the east with their Y chromosome than to the west, and in fact at the time there apparently were no men in the west with their Y chromosome, and you make a very good case that whoever these people were that moved onto the steppes of Russia, they came from the east. It makes sense. But there are two major problems with that. First, the first evidence, the earliest evidence, for both the wheel and metallurgy do not come from the east. They come from the west. And the Sintashta, who live further east, are famous for both. Second, and even more important, whoever these people are that moved onto the steppes of Russia, there are people alive and well today in Europe who look almost exactly like them. And these people live in the southern Balkan Peninsula in central Italy. Even though, once again, the authors of this paper refuse to talk about central Italy. I got around the information embargo by looking at their DNA graph. Let me show you what I found. Here's the full DNA map in the paper. 
On the left, you have modern populations. Stone Age and Bronze Age populations are grayed out. On the right, you have the exact opposite. Stone Age and Bronze Age populations are color-coded, and modern populations are grayed out. Let's zoom in on those Bronze Age steppe populations they're talking about. This is the original population. These are the people we looked at earlier, who'd already mixed with those Anatolian relatives we looked at in the last paper. This is a Sintashta. They're famous for building the chariots and training the horses that invaded India and wrote the Vedas, the oldest scripture in the world and the foundation of the Hindu religion. And in between, we have the Srovnaya. On the graph, they're all sitting right next to each other, but the Srovnaya and the Sintashta both lived at the same time, while the steppe population up top came before both. You see a definite swoop, and in this direction, and wouldn't you know, in that space, but mostly to the right of it, you see a modern population. And note, it's all gray. That means that whoever these people are, despite the fact that the authors swear up and down they figured out where all the white people in Europe came from, they have no idea where these people came from. So who are they? Let's go back to the original graph. Once again, I remind, nobody here knows where these people came from. Let's draw a line straight up and down, and you see they have very little in common with these steppe populations, or once again, any ancient population. Now notice this dramatic swoop right here. This region looks like a head, and the neck is Tuscany, north central Italy. I have to report that, once again, they refuse to look at true central Italians, but obviously they're somewhere on or near this circle. But we do see Bulgarians, Albanians, and Greeks, and they sure as hell didn't do this. So these particular populations, or subsets of populations, are very closely related to the Romans and the people on the steppes of Russia, who in turn had interacted with the people there to form the Sintashta. Now, when you look at the men with the J2AY chromosome, you see that swoop right here. This is a route Julius Caesar took to conquer the Gauls of modern-day France. I knew what that neck was the instant I saw it. Now, let's look over here. My model on where the Romans ultimately came from explains all of this very nicely. First, we walked through this region on our way to Serbia, where we became the Vincia. Then we migrated back through here on our way to Crete and Spain, and no doubt during this whole process a lot of us stayed behind. Then we came in as the Romans, proper. There's a road here taking us back and forth between Italy and Constantinople. There were a lot of Roman colonies planted on that road. Then there's the Byzantine Empire, lately and properly called the Medieval Roman Empire. Constantinople was its capital. Here it's called Istanbul. That's a contraction for Constantinople. And if you watched my last video, Time for Grown-Ups, you know that this is one of the top ten regions as far as having a large concentration of men with my Y chromosome. Central Bulgaria up here is also a top 10. Now, when I first saw these Bulgarians on this DNA map with the Greeks, I did a quick scramble to get to the bottom of who these people were. I was not disappointed, and I'm going to get back to them, just not here or in the next video, but in the one after that, when I deal with Minoan religion. But I will tell you this right now. Not only do these Bulgarians have Roman autosomal DNA, but according to both Christian and Muslim sources, before these Bulgarians became Christian, they had a religion that was almost exactly like the religion that I pulled off the Festus disc, which I consider to be stunning confirmation that I was, in fact, properly reading that disc. Now, since that time, I've gotten more of a handle on the nuance of the old Minoan religion. It was subtle, and it was elegant, and it lurks beneath the surface of the Old Testament, which tells me that the Israelites probably got it from the Minoans, probably by way of the Philistines. Eastern Orthodox Christians have followed this more closely than Catholics, and Protestants are unshakably tone-deaf. Unfortunately, it probably struck their Bronze Age neighbors as weird, and so it almost completely disappeared from later Greek religion, but not Greek culture. The Minoan religion was right in front of our eyes for 25 centuries, and we didn't even know it. I hope you're there, because this is going to be really fun. But let's get back to that DNA. These blue triangles are the Turks, and as you can see, we still have a thin connection with them almost 600 years after the fall of Constantinople. But here's something I'd really like to zero in on. The chasm between the Romans and everybody else in continental Europe except for the Greeks. 
This gap is real, and I've felt it all of my life here in Texas. That's why I've spent all these hundreds of hours getting to the bottom of who my people are. But as big as this gap is, it's nothing compared to what it used to be. As late as 500 BC, when the Roman Republic started, more than 800 years after the Romans started pouring into central Italy, we're still 100 years away from the Gallic invasion of Italy from modern-day France, and more than 1,000 years away from the German invasions. And of course, in between all that time, we had the Roman Empire and the colonies that went with it. The Romans were aliens in an alien world, and they felt it. M. Terentius Varro's most important work was the Antiquitates, divided between 25 books on res humanae and 16 of res divanae, human and divine affairs. Cicero, in a remarkable tribute, says it made the Romans feel like they'd been strangers in their own country, but were now being shown the way home. We even started pulling in the Jews. From looking at this data, I count at least five separate races who call themselves Jewish. Now, obviously, only one of them can be actual descendants of Abraham, or maybe none of them are per se, and they've all formed around a kernel of Abrahamic descendants. I find that very gratifying. We can finally stop listening to those people who babble on about how the Jews know the Bible better than we do since they were born and bred into it. Now, in my last video, from looking at the Y chromosomes of the Ashkenazim, I concluded that about a third of their DNA was probably Roman. But from looking at this information, well more than half of their DNA is Roman. Here are the Ashkenazim. They're right next to the Romans. I call these the Mediterranean Jews, Turkey, Morocco, Tunisia, Libya, Jews from Iran and the Caucasus Mountains group here, and Jews from Yemen. All completely different folks. The Y chromosomes are just as mixed. So let's go back to this quote. I'll let these slides sum up my case nicely. Now remember earlier, when we were talking about the recently discovered Caucasian hunter-gatherers, how a group of people up in Russia looked like us. These are the people I was talking about, and they're right upstream from the Shrubnaya. The reason why the Anatolian and European farmer signal is stronger to the east of the Shrubnaya isn't because those people came from the east. It's because we targeted that territory for its natural resources. It was our industrial center, while the northwest territory was probably our agricultural center. Everything fits hand in glove with my migration model, and I think I've gotten to the bottom of why we left the Balkan Peninsula. Opportunities and material resources were just better here and in the Mediterranean than they were over there, especially the metal. Now before I go, I'd like to talk about two more things. The first is something I'm going to deal with in the next video, when I finally talk about the men with the J2B Y chromosome, as promised. And this in turn is going to feed into the video after that. We're going to talk about these two people here. On the left are the Romans, although at this stage I'm really talking about the Proto-Romans, because we're not Romans yet, but we are well on our way, and we actually start looking like them. Over here are the Phoenicians, and I would say especially the city of Byblos. Tyre and Sidon are more famous, but they arose to prominence later. And the Druze of Syria, very interesting people. And this stream between them I'm calling the Sea People Continuum. Because between these two videos, I'm going to prove beyond any reasonable doubt that we are the Sea People, which means they were the first explosive extension of Roman power into the Mediterranean. Don't feel too bad for the other guys. They picked a fight with the wrong war dogs. Now my next point is something that's very dear to my heart. In fact, it's a question that's driven my research the last couple of years. Although from what I understand, most Europeans won't understand what this question is. And the question is this. Am I white? And the DNA map says pretty much what I thought it would. Maybe. Here we are, the Romans, and we've had our own destiny. But from my understanding here in Texas, the white people would be over here, almost exclusively. Germanic, English, some French, as long as they're Huguenots. They've got some Western hunter-gatherer, they've got some early European farmer, and most importantly, they have those steppe invaders in their lineage. So far, I would say signs point to no. But there's another way of looking at this. The original European hunter-gatherers had an IY chromosome. I have a JY chromosome. We both descend from men with an IJY chromosome. In fact, some of those men are alive and well in Iran today, so we're family. We now know that the Yamna invaders from the steppes of Russia had intermarried with our cousins, and after we moved into Europe and after they invaded, we both intermarried with the same group of native hunter-gatherers and early European farmers, and then we intermarried with each other. So I guess I can say I belong to one of three 
great white tribes, just not the one down here in Texas. I am smugly satisfied with the results of these surveys. They completely, without ambiguity, back up everything I've been saying since my first series working through the Festus disk. I remember about two years ago I got the results of my Y chromosome test back, and I thought, what is a J2A, and how the hell can I be from the Middle East? From there I started studying the Minoans on Crete. When I did that I thought, these people are competent at everything they do. Can they be related to the Romans? And then it was off to the races. About 9,000 years ago, my people started a dance, and ever since then, hundreds of millions have joined us, from the New World all the way to Russia. Their bones have joined us. The blood in their veins has joined us. That dance is a circle, a swastika, an image I have meditated on in all of my videos, and for more than 10 years, ever since I started reading the works of the great Swiss psychologist Carl Gustav Jung. We ourselves are almost a perfect circle. Our longest connection has been with Turkey and the northeast Mediterranean coast, and there a perfect circle has formed. The Muslim invasions and conquests have apparently interrupted our progress. It's distressing to see. Had things continued the way we wanted, North Africa, Turkey, and the eastern Mediterranean would have looked a lot more like Germany and France than what it does. Too bad for them. But as they've taught us so well, what has been done can always be undone and redone. Just look at Europe. The Spanish are the orange on the bottom, and the east coast of the Mediterranean. And of course the Jews, who we've already talked about, all spokes in a near-perfect spiral. And if you imagine a world like this in full bloom, each of those surrounding loops could be its own full circle, and this would be a flower, written in our bones and in our blood. When we laid claim to Christ's church on earth, we didn't do it because we were greedy or vain, although the motives of individual popes and clergymen might vary. We did it because we could, and the DNA speaks to that louder than we ever could. Jews and Muslims and even Mormons can say whatever they want. It's a free planet. But we have put in the honest sowing, and we have reaped our honorable reward. The most beautiful, the most dynamic, the most creative civilization on the planet Nobody comes close. So yes, I will take that victory lap.
Central Italy and the Southern Balkans, Rome and Constantinople. This is not an accident. This has been coming for thousands of years. Here's a preview of what I've got coming up. 